All right, let's start. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. It's been a while. Um, welcome to our 31st Core Dev call. As always, just some quick context. These Core Dev calls are for core contributors to present what's been working on and discuss upcoming features, protocol changes with community members like you. While there's time for Q&A, um, after each topic, I uh, encourage you all to continue the conversations over forum discords github everything is out in the open as always and we do want your feedback uh, i'll also paste in the uh in the zoom chat and the show notes the link to our ecosystem calendar you can find the qr code here as well uh, that'll get you to the ecosystem calendar which will then allow you to subscribe to future calls so you don't miss on any there's also indexer office hours builders office hours you can see all of those and lastly I also highly encourage everyone to uh, check our forums. We have monthly updates from the core, core dev teams. And yeah, you just go to the forum.thegraph.com and you should see them right away. Um, we would love to see you there, helping out, participating, asking questions. That's the right, that's, that's the right place. Now onto the agenda, we have three items today, uh, big ones though. From streaming fast, we have Alex Borger. He's going to present a nice, pretty cool substreams development tool for SPS or substreams powered subgraphs. Um, then we'll have Tomash from the Edge Note team, the smart contracts team. We're going to go about, we're going to talk about the two new GIPs you might have seen recently being shared in our forum. That is Graph uh, Horizon, which we'll, we've been covering for a while, and also the uh, subgraph. Service. So things are a lot more polished now, and hopefully uh, Tomas will make it even more clear for us what those changes are and what the plan is. And I think that's all for now on my side. So let's start with Alex. So hi, I'm Alex. I'm CTO at Streaming Fast, another thing there. Today I wanted to present a few uh, fruits of our work to ease onboarding. We've been working for the last, uh, you know, two months and a half now to really simplify onboarding and also to, um, to help people write substreams powered subgraphs as fast as possible. So just a quick reminder here that substreams powered subgraph are a shift in the backend used by the graph node. And instead of hitting a JSON RPC node to pull for blocks, it uses the substreams engine as its backend. So, uh, we have in the last a few months, year now, developed quite a few modules that are published on substreams.dev, which is a repository of common modules. And, uh, and in there, you can feed those into GraphNode. And so there was two mode of integration into GraphNode. The first was writing entities. Substreams managed to create the entities, entities, I'm, I'm meaning the, the GraphNode concept, subgraph concept, and it would write under the belly of subgraphs and then it would make the query um, qu query layer available. But recently, there's been the next mode of integration, which is much more interesting. We call it the trigger-based mode of integration, which means subgraphs are there literally to shape triggers. And then they will trigger assembly script code, just like you do normally with events and whatnot. But that layer is chain agnostic because you can send any payload that comes from any backend, any chain, any protocol, <clears throat> even different from Ethereum. And it sends that inside your mapping.ts in assembly script. So today I'm going to demo one thing. The new development, let's say, experience we provided for people who want to develop substreams, substreams per se, major improvements to the GUI, the interfaces there. And also uh, I'm going to demo how people can craft easily from a substreams down to a subgraph and start programming in a subgraph with not without looking to the substreams code, right? If they want, they could go there, improve some performance, do a little bit more work there, because that uh, layer, the substreams layer, can scale horizontally pretty easily. It's a parallelized engine, <clears throat> and then we can choose what we do inside subgraph. So we get a blend of these two worlds. I think it's a very interesting thing, and we'll also be presenting a development environment that I think is pretty slick. So I'm going to start right away. Uh, one of the first thing I wanted to show you guys is this repo. It's a public repo. 
We're still like honing out a few things, but it's basically the place to get started nowadays. And I don't know, maybe I'm going to stop just for a second here, give you a quick primer on what we decided to do. We decided to provide a fully contained development environment for <clears throat> substreams and subgraphs. So in here, we've been using the dev container technology. I don't know if you guys know that, but containers and development containers in the last three years have seen a crazy amount of new maturity. They've been integrated in major IDEs like JetBrains IDEs, VS Code, and others. And there's a lot of tools around. Now that's supported by Microsoft. And GitHub has prime support through what they call GitHub code spaces. I don't know if you guys know, if you come here and you hit the dot, there's one key on your keyboard, this dot, right? Comma, a point. If you click on that, it opens immediately in this environment. It's a place where you can edit. You have VS Code directly integrated. Remember, GitHub has been purchased by Microsoft, huh? So you have that very profound integration where you have all of your extensions, the things that you know to work with, you can do some commits here and all that. So that's the first layer that they did an integration and you don't spin up any machine here. But if you go back and you open in a code space, that's the environment I wanna show you today. We create a code space that is paid for, but there's a few hours, like 60 hours free per month. You can try there. <clears throat> this is gonna spin up a machine and it's going to build the container environment that we have designed for you to be able to do all the things, substreams development. It runs IPFS, it has a graph node, it has a, you know, a, a PG web, so you can connect to the Postgres database. It has an embedded Postgres database. You have all the tools for development. Um, let me show you here, if you go back to starter, the things that are included in the environment, you have substreams pre-installed, all the rough tool chain, the buff stuff for protobuf building, NPM and Node, all the subgraph services, like these directly accessible and a pre-configured VS Code extension for all the things. So TypeScript support. We even have a custom substreams extension to slowly help you with the mundane task, you know, of, um, I don't know, of, of substreams development for running of the build, for instance, and whatnot. So this here will take two or three minutes, but in the meantime, I'm gonna show you, you can run it fully locally, uh, fully in the web there, and it works. It'll allow you to do all your development there. You can stop the machine, rerun it, and pay just for the time it runs, and you'll have all the databases. You could literally go build your whole project in there, commit, send it to your repo on GitHub, and uh, you would never need to check that out on your local machine. So that's pretty awesome. See, we're installing a feature. There's a substreams binary in there. It's nicely laid out in the... Um, in the uh, dev container specification. I encourage you to do that. And a small story about that is that Shopify, I've spoken with you a few guys. I, were, I used to work Shopify and, and I remember setting up the machine there. It took a lot of time because they have a lot of services and you know, it's bulky. And in the last three years, Shopify has shifted 95% of their developers, their own developers, those developing the Shopify, you know, store and all the things to use containerized and remote building environments. This allows you to have ports that are exposed, like if you expose the port, it's exposed through you know, a, an endpoint that you can access and share with people, right? So you can have all these ports exposed. So you know, suddenly have all these staging environments ad hoc with replicable environments. So it's a great environment in the end. So we're gonna try it here, okay? And then I'm gonna show you how we could also run it completely locally. So if we're to start here, see now you get with the, the dev, you even have an extension with a, you know, uh, some, um, some instruction. I'm gonna shut that down here for now. And we're gonna start our experiment. We would do substreams in it, okay? And here I'm gonna try and let's say an EVM minimal. I wanna see just the minimal code that can be produced. And I'm gonna call my project, my project. This is an interactive, see, interactive prompt for, um, for code generation, just like graph in it. I'm gonna, on Ethereum mainnet, start in black thing, I don't know, block. Uh, thousand and then here yeah i'm going to overwrite the readme file and now you see here what we have have we overwritten this one let me see okay this is a small bug i want to keep the um the starter kit so uh, this this produces in the directory see i have the instruction to continue 
I have an idea of what the files are about. You know, that, that proto my data is a proto buff. That's going to be the output of my substreams module. And then I have a few module definition in here, less important. This is the main entry point. So I can understand and learn that this is the place where I'm going to, I don't know, craft data. Here is very simple. I'm taking the block from Ethereum. I'm extracting a few bits of information and I'm outputting that my data structure, which is defined here. And I don't know if you noticed, but the coloring, syntax highlighting is all present for Proto, for Rust. And I'm going to be able to come here and say substreams build, which is a new function that like simplifies all the build steps for you. It's going to generate the stuff build using cargo, which is all pre-installed. It's to produce your binary, which we'll be able to stream a moment after, right? So you see, I'm going to init, whoops. And then build, we're going to authenticate. We've simplified also that flow, which is, I think is very neat. And the GUI has seen a big revamp. And then just after, we're going to see how we could code gen for subgraphs and see how, like, while that's building, I'm going to show you something here. In the container environment here. So first, notice that it automatically installed the Docker extension and, uh, you know, the uh, GitHub pull request extension. That's the way our container has been designed. And it's already running graph node. Here, it's waiting for the authentication. We made a small script there. Once we're authenticated, boom, graph node is going to start fully authenticated to the different substreams endpoints that are around, and we can start streaming directly in graph node. So we'll, we'll get to, down to that uh, after. But just to show that, look, you can see view logs here. You have the logs of IPFS. You have the IPFS logs from, uh, what's the port of IPFS? I don't know. I'll show you. I'll show you from within. Okay, the service is all, all running there, and in there you can also, you know, attach shell. You go in the five thousand and one, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I know, uh, but it should be exposed here. I'm going to show it in the in the local um, in the local environment. Okay, there's an issue. The trick is that there's an issue. So, okay, so here we're doing what? Where are we? Bash. It's been built, and I'm going to do substreams GUI. So I don't need to think very much. Yeah, a lot of the default, you know, has been improved. And when we hit Substreams GUI, we're getting into this now. Magnificent logo and ASCII art took a lot of time to build. And so here we now have, you know, all the defaults. So you just hit enter. If there would be any back processing, it would show here. Otherwise, we'd be sent to the output tab. And now, as you see, it doesn't start right away. It brings you to an environment that you can constantly re reuse. I'm going to stream here. Oh, I'm not authenticated. Yes, that's right. So I'm going to quit that and say substreams off. I forgot. Okay, and now this flow is a new flow. It's a way for us to go to the graph market and authenticate within that, let's say, flow of events. And over here, it's going to automatically create a key, a development key, generate a new token, and allow me to copy it. And I'm still understanding where I am here, right? We're on a the graph market beta, and then I'm going to go and copy it back into oops, my environment here. Oh, I'm going to give it access to my clipboard. And see here, boom. Now I've loaded it. It's, it's saved in the substreams. And let me show you something cool, because I think it's cool. The graph node has detected it was available. Boom, and it booted. So now it's oh, hidden password. Thank you. Now the thing is syncing, so I could be building and shipping things in there. But I I, I just want to show you the uh, the streaming GUI stuff here, okay? And so if I run substreams GUI now, well, it's going to pick up the credentials from there. So we have a an agreed upon. One of the great things about these dev environments is that because the things are all agreed upon, you know where you're handing, you can greatly simplify the flow because you can know where things, it's more of a convention rather than configuration, hand-based. So the GUI is going to pick up the the um, credentials, and then the stream is going to go directly. I don't know if you've seen that, but it streamed a thousand blocks already. You want to see that again? Let's say I'm going to change request to go from start block. This is a change of, of interface two. We can now specify start block, stop block. Let's do it for 2,000 blocks instead. Okay? And notice, notice the little bar here is going to fill up, and this is the block count, and you see the, the progress down here. You ready? Stream. So so we're going through here, 2,000 blocks. Now we, we started at 10,000 here. 
So, and now I can go through, I have keys, right? You can see he blocked navigation with OP. Uh, I can go from one block to the other, and I'm looking at the data that was produced. This is the data that was produced by my module. See here? Now let me try a trick. I see no logs. Let me print something. Log, print LN, uh, hello, uh, logs. And, and you know, I'm going to do something. So for that, we need to just import uh, use substreams log, okay, I think. And we're going to do some hello world log, but let's format it. Rust has this way of formatting things, I think, with, uh, I don't know, something like that. Huh? Block dot number, BLK number. Let me try that. So there's a new build tab here. See that? If I just hit B, it's rebuilding. It's complete. And then I can come back and then stream again with S. Oh, no, R. Sorry, R. And then it's going to restream again. You see that lo loading here? Up, oh, I'm pointing at my screen. You don't see that. But see, these are loaded. Now I see the logs. I can like inspect things at great speed anywhere in the chain. And then I can hit you know capital L here to toggle logs. And there's a bunch of things we can do here. OK, so I won't do the full intro to the uh, to the, the GUI. But we've improved the, the info tab, which gives you an idea of what the, the modules are. And um, I don't know of interest, maybe the substreams that was produced there. <clears throat> Points, you know, that's all scaffolded by the uh, by the code generator. Okay. And we highly encourage people to write their own readme because this is the way the documentation gets picked up, picked up nowadays. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go on my machine just to show you a different experience, but really the same. I'm going on my machine here, I'm in Substream Starter. I'm gonna open VS Code, okay? And this here is, it automatically suggests, VS Code does that, that we reopen in the container because it detects there's a dev container and then it's gonna start Docker Compose with all the things. Oh. What is that? Okay, you can have these things here. Let's say reopen in container. So that's the demo gods. Ah. Okay, that's bad. Let me try that again. I'm going to quit code. Start that. It worked just a moment before. Reopen in container. Maybe it's because I destroyed the... Uh, Workspace folder not specified. Okay, let me try to define that workspace folder. I'm going to make that workspace. Okay. And then it's going to detect changes, rebuild, and reopen. There you go. So you get something very similar to what you're getting on the web. And now it's all local, backed by uh backed by local Docker installation. And okay, it's all ready because I had it built. But if I just modify the environment there, boom, I can rebuild. It uses all the Docker layers, Docker Compose that is defined in here. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm going to come back here and then I'm going to open a terminal, substreams, init. Now I'm going to try an injective one. Okay. Injective is going to be called my project, my mama, inject. My... Alex, just one quick question. I got confused. Yeah, so go is this running locally? Is is this bootstrapping the old containers locally or still connected to the cloud dev environment, but just using so a different, this just developer using VS Code? environment? Yes, this VS Code is connected to my own local Docker instance. Okay, so it local. Is possible, it is possible for this thing to connect to a remote. Like there are remote repositories and remote... Uh, you know, you can connect to okay. a code space, and then you'd be developing locally, connecting to remote. These things have been very well, like I, it was also another thing I may, might show you fast if you have that question there. There's called thing dev pod. Dev pods are like code spaces, but local, or they can run on multiple um, backends. Uh, I mean, you know, Amazon or the Google Cloud or Azure, and it spins a machine and it controls it remotely, and it gives you an environment that is remote, but it's the same abstraction with user. Right, files are edited remotely, all the containers remote remotely, but you boot it locally and you can have a shared disk. So this is another way to boot to boot a local container, but VS Code experience is pretty slick. You can have all these providers and whatever. Uh, so I'm using uh, the default VS Code experience right now. So I'm going and continuing here. I'm, I'm initializing a project for injective and then injective mainnet. I'm gonna use, we'll start from, I don't know, block zero. 
and we're going to inject for specific events. Okay, the event I'm going to match here is it's called message. And then here, I don't know what that is. You want to add another event type? No. And so I'm going to overwrite to get ignore. Yes, let's say overwrite it. Oh no, not today. And the readme. No, not today. Okay. So and then I'm going to get. If I look at the files here on my local project, again, a substreams that is already configured for injective. And it uses the parameters. So this is not even having any Rust code. We're just providing a module. You don't even need to Rust because the, the Rust code is in here compiled for you. You're merely using it here by configuring it. It's, it's string. So this one is going to do a filtered events for you of type messages. And there's a small language you can put in there. This is all documented in the adjective common. So what we're going to do here is substreams build. It's going to be very fast because it's not even doing any, you know, uh, Rust compilation. And then my goal is to create substreams cogen subgraph. And out of this, I'm going to get to choose which module I have. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, start from. And then it's there in subgraph. See the the folder appeared. And now what do I get here? I get a subgraph. It is a trigger based. So you see it's a kind of graph entities that'll change eventually. This is the mappings file, which we're going to explore in a second. It calls the handler handle triggers. I'm going to show you in a second. And it uses the map events from this substring. That's the source on you know which network injective mainnet. So now from that point on, you can modify whatever you want. This is a, a simple subgraph. And in the mappings, what you get is input, and you'll have all these, whatever is in the list, event list, you'll have completion there. But before we do that, let me show you that you can go in there, npm install. Let me add another thing. I think a few npm stuff already installed. Oops, subgraph. And then I'm going to look at the, uh, uh, there's a few commands, right? There's the cogen command, npm run cogen. Oh yeah, it needs to finish installing it. Sorry, just a second. So we'll install the dependencies. And after that, we have everything we need to uh, you know, generate the proto buffs for assembly script. That's pre-installed. Buff is installed and the package that we need there. And so from there, we can run code gen. This will create whatever, you know, I don't remember the generated stuff. Remember the schema? Uh, there's another command is uh, generate, npm run generate. That's for the proto buff stuff. It has a few errors, but I think it doesn't matter. And here, see, we have uh, the PB stuff, right? For Cosmos and whatever. This is a Cosmos chain. And so from in here now, these event lists, see, they, they'll, uh, they'll now autocomplete. So input, is it events? Or I can you know, dig into the, uh, what's the proto event list? Event list. Whoop, 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 whoop. Substreams, Cosmos, events, event attribute. So you have all that locally. Okay, maybe there's a few issues there. <clears throat> and um, so if we say head again, and then we'll want to create local. That's very interesting. Let me tweak that file here though, because locally, I, we're, we're, we're shaping that up. It's going to be accessed through this endpoint. Well, that's going to be IPFS. Because locally, I have all these ports open. And you can open a small window here. Is it 20? Local host, no, 2020, has it started? Oh, wait a second, I haven't authenticated yet. So let me come here, substreams off, right? Remember, I'm gonna go and visit that site. It's gonna give me another jot, copy, and then I'll have it authenticated. What we haven't seen is the uh, in the, the graph node, uh, now it's started. And now it's starting to sync the chain, right? It's sort of the, because it detected that we now picked up the substreams env, and that's running. Okay, so this is good. And now here, if I go to subgraph, I can say, what's the thing? Create local. npm run create local. I think this thing builds, does it? Oh no, it created over there. And if I what, deploy local. Let me try that. Is that gonna work? I'm not sure this is gonna work, guys. So this should build stuff, right? And then deploy it to there. And there's the IPFS node that is accessible through this 514, but I think it's web UI. So here, see, 
you're accessing the full environment. And there's going to be files that are published. I don't know how they're laid out. Whatever, peer ID, something like that. And all these pods and all these things are accessible there. See, this is PGSQL giving you access to some stuff that is exposed to that port. Alex, Directly gentle warning. Yeah. We have one one minute and uh, let's leave some time for Q&A. Q &A. So, so yeah, look, so. with this, you can go, I'm gonna just change that back to localhost. And then you're in there. I'm gonna query stuff, entity with it, my, what is it here? My entities, will that work? Failed, not started syncing. It needs to start syncing. And eventually you would see in there a really fast sync. Because the thing, if you look at the logs there, when it picks it up, error stream, whatever, protocol, invalid, bad gateway, some things happening. Okay, so I ran it just before. It synced 100,000 blocks pretty fast. It goes at high speed and you can query the thing directly. So it's basically an environment for substreams and subgraph development, all local. Any questions? I have one question, Alex, before we move on, just a quick, quick one. So the first part you were on this cloud dev environment, uh, GitHub powered. So I yes. guess that is, uh, and that abstracts the whole thing. It, it, it bootstraps all the containers or all your stack. Everything. I'm guessing that's probably using Microsoft Azure or whatever, since it's a Microsoft product. Uh, but that is that, I had never, never used it. It's called GitHub code space or what was it? Yes. Called? Is it yeah. code space? Code space. Yeah. You could use that. All right. Or you could use a thing like that. Is a pod. paid feature, but you could but you could also use. Yeah, but I'm just uh, trying to understand that that's a, a paid service, right? That that one yes. in particular. Yes, GitHub code but space. they do offer be, like a free, uh, a lot of free stuff, free time. So anyway, okay. Or you can put it in there, and that pops. Regardless, up. the whole the whole framework. <laughs> Yeah, regardless of the whole framework, you can also run locally. You can benefit from the abstraction that you've built uh, and also run stuff locally, right? You don't you don't need to touch the cloud 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 stuff. This here, so as I'm showing you, that's another button I want to offer an option to people. It would clone the URL directly and it would start in VS Code running from Docker container. It would not be managed by VS Code. So you could even use Vim or SSH into the pod. Everything would be in there. A very similar experience. Or you could use a different provider. There's a bunch of providers if you want. And there's really wonky providers like the Flow Exoscale, CloudBit, you know, people, OVH Cloud, whatever, or yeah, SSH, like random container machine. as a service. But this is a pretty robust ecosystem I've discovered. Yeah. Actually, I'm really happy to discover that because I think not a lot of people in this space have used those latest breed of a development environment. And when you have replicable environment like that, you can do a lot of testing. You can have isolated things. They all run in containers. They run easily on servers too, but they're attached to the um, to the experience of the developer, right? With VS Code extensions and things that you specify about the environment. Like one thing I haven't shown there is that if you can run tasks, you can have, you, there's a special task for build packages. Substreams is a few things, right? Generate substreams, modules, authenticate, all these things are part of the extension. So there's great things we could do to simplify the experience. Now there's a few hiccups there, but definitely they're being solved. Um, no. Does that answer the question? Yeah. It does, appreciate that. All right, let's follow up uh, on Slack and uh, Discord and, and uh, I actually need to talk to Marcus on, um, Marcus is leading the builder's office hours. So we should make sure that uh, the audience there, because those are mostly dev people, obviously, they should know about about this, and uh, we can follow up offline um, on this, Alex. Very good. Thank Thanks, you for Marcus. your time, guys. I see thumbs up. Yeah, thank you. All right, moving on to Marsh. Great. So first thing, it's great to be back. I think it's been a while since I presented here. Uh, so happy to be here. Um, the, the idea for today is to talk a little bit about uh, Graph Horizon. Um, you might have noticed uh, recently we published uh two GFPs uh 66 and 68 um related to graph horizon and the uh subgraph data service um there's also a previous post uh in the forums with graph horizon explained um this was a few months old i think uh but it contains like kind of like the philosophy or the ideas behind the graph horizon uh, the two GFPs are more more like 
related to like the implementation and like concrete uh, details. Um, they are both quite lengthy, and I think the original forum post is lengthy as well. Um, it, I mean, it, it's quite a bit of material. So I wanted today to try to provide like a quick intro or overview. Uh, we probably don't have enough time to touch like everything in detail, but uh, yeah, we can follow up uh, later via Slack channels or also like any feedback you have if you want to share on the forums, wherever uh, you think it's reasonable, we would like to hear uh, your thoughts on, on everything that we've been building. Uh, I see the chat. Okay. Right. Um. Uh, also worth noting, uh, we've been working on an implementation on the uh, for the proposal uh, on both GIPs. Uh, that, that's currently under audit. Uh, but we are still working on that, right? That's, uh, we also have a second audit coming in in a couple of months. Um. So like, we are auditing stuff, but nothing is set in stone. So don't be afraid to speak up. Uh, if you see something that's uh you think it's wrong or, or you have ideas you want to contribute. Right, um, and last detail here to mention perhaps is that uh, we present this as two GIPs, um, mostly because of the length, uh, but you they should really be considered as the same thing uh, in the sense that like we cannot go forward with one of them if we don't have the other one, right? Uh, so we should treat the both as a, as a unit. Okay. So first things, um, what what is Graph Horizon? Um, so I think about Horizon as the evolution of the current protocol, the, the Graph protocol. Um, previously, we've, uh, we've like presented two ideas, and I think the original forum post talks about this. Um, one idea was, OK, we can deploy a completely new protocol, similar to what Uniswap does, right? We have V1, V2, V3, V4. Uh, but they're all isolated between each other. Um, and then the other approach was uh, quote unquote like brownfield approach, which is okay, we can upgrade our current protocol and transform it into whatever our like uh, target uh, design is. Um, so that's the route we've uh, finally uh, selected after like consulting with the with the tab and uh, with the draft council. Uh, like consensus was that due to like one us wanted to keep like network effects and other considerations we would like take the current pro protocol and like evolve it like upgrade it right the contract for april into a uh, graph horizon um so with that said uh horizon uh, like the core idea is that it's a data services protocol right the idea is to facilitate uh permissionless like creation and competition of different types of data services. Um, and what we really mean by that is like here on the top part of the diagram, uh, you can see like the current version of the protocol, if you will, like you have like indexers and data consumers and the, the protocol kind of serves as a, uh, like as a bridge, okay, for the data consumers to get to the indexers. The idea with Horizon is Okay, you can have now like several data services that rely on the primitives of Graph Horizon, which we'll cover in a bit. Um, but then, like a service provider might choose to like only offer a particular type of data service. Maybe they are do, like they are only uh, uh, like providing data service number two or three, uh, while like you have another service provider that like only doing subgraph data service. Um, and the same thing goes. To consumers, right? Consumer might be interested in a specific data service and they might not care about the others. The idea for Horizon is that we can accommodate all these different types of uh, data service. Here's like a very high level overview of the contract or different parts in, in Horizon. Um, we have a bunch of uh, Periphery or, or legacy contracts here in yellow in the bottom, uh, but the the main the main contracts here and the main uh, the most important ones are uh, the green ones and the purple ones. Uh, you've noticed here in the legend that uh, we kind of split 
them into like the staking protocol and the payments protocol. Um, another way of like describing Horizon is like you can think of it as a as a complementary components or sub protocols. One being the staking part and the other one being like the payments part, right? So Horizon has primitives that facilitate staking and payments for a data service. That's the like the, the core idea. Uh, so let's focus first on the staking part. Uh, sorry. Um, so the staking portion of Horizon is uh, designed to um, to provide primitive uh, that allow the data service to have uh, like economic security for the exchange of data they do between like service providers and data consumers. Um, the idea is that a data service that's using Horizon, they can leverage the primitive and the economic security that the staking protocol uh, offers. Um, and they don't have to like uh, implement uh, anything of that. Here, oops, sorry. Um, so the main, the main, I think, concept or idea to understand uh, regarding the staking protocol is uh, a new concept we introduced. It's called the provisions. Uh, provisions, you can think of them as a, like a generalized version of an allocation. Um, a provision really is just like take from a service provider that's assigned to a specific data service. Um, here in, in, in this diagram, you can see like the top row, you can that there's a bunch of stakes that uh, corresponds to a service provider uh, X. Um, and they they provisioned, that's the term we were using, uh, that take into one, two, three different uh, provisions. Each one of those correspond to a different data service. Uh, so you see like provision number one has the most amount of stake. Uh, provision number two has uh, a lot less and Provision number three is somewhere in the middle. Um, then uh, the last three rows kind of want to show how each one of the data service is using the resources that they have assigned to, right? Uh, for instance, the this one in the middle uh, it corresponds to, let's say, the subgraph service, the subgraph data service. Um, for the subgraph data service can use up all these stakes that uh, described by the like, provision number one. And internally, the subgraph service might choose to use that stake like in like further assignments, which in this case are called allocations, uh, which is the concept we're all familiar with. Um, and that's at the subgraph service level, right? Other data services might use other mechanisms, other ways of uh, making use of the, of the stake. Um, and this next slide maybe also has uh, understanding what the primitive uh, horizon offers for a data service. Um, remember, again, a provision is like a one-to-one -one, uh, with a data service, right? So here uh, on the top left, you have a service provider that like can go and stake uh, some GRT into the uh, staking contract. And that stake can further be used for uh, different provisions, right? You take a part of that and you assign it to, okay, let's say provision one. Uh, you can obviously like get that back by deprovisioning. Uh, you could also like reprovision, which is take a stake from provision one and put it into provision number two. Um, and the provision stake, uh, in this case, uh, the amount that's provisioned to, I don't know, service that service provider number one assigned to this provision that corresponds to a data service. Um, when you create the provision, you the service provider kind of grants the data service the ability to flash that provision. And that's what gives the data service uh, the tools to ensure that the, there is economic security behind the, the actions that the service provider is gonna, is gonna perform for them, right? Remember, like a data service is all about a service provider uh, providing a service to someone that's paying, right? They, they do some sort of work and they expect to get paid. Um, the flashing component here is what ensures that, okay, that 
the stake that's here is like really relevant and it, uh, it provides uh, economic security. Um, I see some comments in the chat, but I see Pablo is already on top of that. Uh, let me know if I need to intervene. We're good. Um, We're good. Pablo is taking a look. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, obviously, we also have uh, delegators and delegation in here. Uh, delegators can come in and delegate to a service provider. Uh, one of the differences is that uh, delegator now need to specify. Uh, oh, I think I have an extra slide here. Wait, yeah, here. So the delegation is now uh, per data service, as well as per uh, sub um, service provider. I'm sorry. So you need to specify. Okay, I want to delegate uh, one million GRT to uh, I don't know take uh, quid on the uh, subgraph service. Um, the reason for that is. Um, like stake squid might be very good at doing like subgraph indexing, but they maybe are really bad at doing, I don't know, substreams or whatever other data services we have. So when you have a delegator, like put your stake, uh, commit a stake to a, to a service provider, like you don't want them to like misuse that. So you only, they can only use it for the specific purpose you assign it to. And that's done by specifying both the service provider and the data service that you want to delegate. Um, another big change uh, is that delegation is uh, sure. Yeah, Pablo, I think I agree. <laughs> um, so another change is that delegation now in Horizon will be slashable um, with some protections, obviously. Uh, delegation, like we found that delegation in order to be meaningful uh, to provide meaningful economic security, it requires that it's uh, flashable. Uh, there are like, a few things to consider here and, and a lot of details uh, hidden uh, on this statement, uh, which we can like discuss uh, offline if anyone's interested. Uh, but the, the important thing here is that there are uh, protections for delegators. And the most significant one is uh, if an indexer, or oh, sorry, if a service provider gets flashed, um, the, their entire stake is first at risk. And only if the slashed amount exceeds whatever stake they have, only then the delegator's stake is at risk, right? So that's a way of saying, okay, like the service provider needs to screw up uh, really bad. And they are also like, they have skin in the game and they will lose everything before delegators get uh, their stake slashed. Uh, so that's a, the, there are other protections in place, um, but that's kind of like the compromise uh, we we yeah we found was was accepted. Uh, and lastly, there is no delegation tax uh, in Horizon at all. So that's that's nice. Okay, um, the next component or the next like sub protocol within Horizon is the payments protocol. As I mentioned, the, ma the main function of a data service is to provide a service to a data consumer. Um, and they expect to be paid in return, right? Uh, we found that the, <clears throat> the common, a common schema or a common design for this is uh, using uh, an intermediary. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> in, a, in like the most common cases, the gateway, like the gateway is the uh, intermediate between like the consumer and the protocol or the service providers. Um, <clears throat> and the payments protocol is just, uh, it's a generalization of TAP or it's pretty close uh, to TAP. Um, it's a trust minimized way of uh, like handling payments between uh, the one that's paying and the service provider, right? And the idea is that it, uh, it's gonna support uh, different types of payments. And I'll get into that uh, in a second. Um, this is like a high level overview of what the payment flow uh, would look like in the case of a generic data service. Um, you have uh, here in green, these are the contracts that correspond to the payment contracts on the on graph horizon. Uh, and you have like a generic data service here. So the first step is 
okay, the payer, uh, the gateway, or whoever is paying, they deposit funds on the on the payment system, um, and then the service provider uh, knows, okay, the payer can pay for my service, so they uh, they are now uh, ready to enter a relationship with the payer. So they serve the a, a query from a customer or whatever like service they provide. And the payer will give them uh, a receipt, a voucher, or any evidence really that proves that there there is an outstanding debt with them. Um, usually, the service provider will then get that uh, evidence and post it on chain on the data service, which is uh, step three here, uh, and that initiates the payment collection. The payment collection goes uh, first through a stage, which is here uh, the payment collector like contract uh, payment collectors are uh, like depending on the type of payment that you are trying to collect uh, you will use one or a diff like a specific uh, collector uh, that's going to be tightly coupled with uh, the data service design and the gateway like those three all go together for instance um, the subgraph service is going to use a uh, tap collector, that's what we call it, which essentially is like a, for any request response receipt based uh, type of, you know, uh, exchange between the parties, then you would want to use uh, this tap collector. Uh, there are other types of payments that you can, uh, maybe something like dips would use, uh, would have like ongoing or periodic payments. That's like a different, uh, type of payment is like a different schema, so you would need a different collection. Um, whatever collector you choose, or rather the data, data service chooses, uh, eventually that gets to the payment system, right? Uh, and the payment system is the one that's holding the fund from the payer, and eventually that gets distributed to all the relevant parties, uh, right? You, you have a, a big portion of that that goes back to the service provider, that's the fees that they generated for the service. Uh, but you also have uh, like a portion might go to delegators or a portion might get burned uh, or a portion might get sent back to the data service kind of as a fee or, or yeah, whatever. That's that's going to depend on the data service. Uh, okay. Um, I think I have a couple more slides, but I try, I realized they're short on time. Um, the data service framework. So what's this? Um, with Horizon, we are also like uh, describing or proposing this framework, which is two things. First is a, like a generalized flow that describes how a data service should integrate with Graph Horizon. Um, and to facilitate that, uh, we also provide a contract library um, that should act as a base layer for anyone that wants to build a data service using Horizon. Um, this is, I'm not, not going to go into the details of this, but this is kind of like a an overview of the generalized flow for the data service framework. Um, if you try to read this, which is not very readable, uh, like at first, the service provider here on the top left needs to like stake on Horizon, uh, on the staking contract. Uh, they need to create a provision and then they need to go and register to the data service. Uh, then there have like a few special methods uh, signaling that, okay, I'm starting to provide a service. So you have this start service uh, function proposed here. Uh, you also have a sub service uh, and you also have like a collect, collect flow, which is used for collecting payments. And if you see like the collect uh, flow here interacts with the graph payment contract, the collector and everything else that we just described. Um, so the, the, the framework is, is really um, like designed to provide like a standard way of building data services and like ensuring like quality and, and all of that. Okay, so the subgraph service. Um, I mentioned before there are two GIPs. The first one covers uh, graph horizon. So everything I just described and a lot, lot more. Um, and the second GIP covers the subgraph service. Uh, the subgraph service is 
a data service, a new data service that supports the indexing subgraph and serving queries use case, which that's what we have today on the graph or the current version of the, of the graph protocol, right? So the subgraph service is mostly replacing uh, that which we are taking away from the staking contract. Okay, um, for the most part, the subgraph service is very similar to what we have today um, in the sense of how indexers operate and, and everything else. Um, the biggest departure maybe is that um, for the subgraph service, um, and I think in general for data services on Horizon, this is what we recommend, uh, that any form of payment uh, that comes as a result of work performed by a service provider, it needs to be collateralized and secured by stake in a Horizon provision. So what that really means is that, let's say for the subgraph service, we have two types of work. We have uh, indexers index uh, subgraph, right? And they get indexing reward uh, for that, uh, but they also serve queries and they get query fees for that. Today, uh, indexers only need to like lock stake and use that as, as economic security for the indexing part, right? When they collect query fees, uh, there is no like additional uh, locking. They just like get the query fees back uh, without any any other like commitment from them. Um, yeah. In Horizon and with the subgraph service, we propose uh, like any form of payment needs to have collateralized uh, stake. And that means that when you collect query fees, uh, a portion of your provision also needs to get locked for a, a period of time. Uh, kind of, uh, and that acts as like, a, that, okay, I know that for this service, this query that I just uh, got a response to, like there is some stake that's like backing uh, the disclaim and then like providing the security that this was a correct response. Um, there's a lot uh, to this concept. Um, I'm not sure I'm making it justice here, uh, but and if you have any questions about this, like we can, you can come uh, to me or Pablo or Miguel or anyone else, and we can talk about this. Um, one important thing to consider here is, um, so if you take a look at the stake that you have available here on the left, uh, that stake is gonna be used for allocations, same as today. Uh, but also for like claiming query fees, as I just described. Um, and one way of doing that would be like, okay, there's a single pool of stake and we have to like use that for both use cases. Uh, we've decided that it was more like capital efficient if we like could uh, like reuse the same pool of stake for each one of those cases. So each one will have individual accounting. Uh, it means uh, like you, we are like doing some stake leveraging here, but we think it's a, a good trade-off. And lastly, and I think this is the last uh, couple of slides, I'm almost on time. Um, allocations are pretty much the same as today. There's still like a one-to-one -on -one, one -one mapping of uh, take from a service provider to a subgraph deployment that remains the same. The biggest difference is that they are uh, now uh, long-lived. So that means that like they can live in an open state forever. You don't need to close them and reopen every 28 days or nothing like that. Um, as a consequence of that, like you now need to present uh, POIs periodically, uh, which actually it's the same when it works today, right? You need to present POI periodically, but today when you present a POI, you close the location and you reopen it. Uh, so now the allocation will stay open, but you can present periodically to collect index rewards. Um, uh, another caveat to this is that, uh, like, if you don't present a POI after like uh, a configurable amount of time, uh, let's say 28 days, uh, your allocation becomes stale. That means that the next time you present a POI, you won't get any reward, right? Because you you spent uh, quite a considerable amount of time without uh, providing any proof of your work. Um, and in order to like to guarantee like network freshness and ensure that, uh, like we want to have like periodically presented POIs. Um, but as soon as you present a valid POI, then from there onward, like you will still like be entitled back to 
like your application won't be considered stale anymore and you will get rewards after that. Um, and stale POIs can be closed by anyone. That's uh, important to note here. Um, okay, and I think this, this is just like an example of what I just say. Like, let's say I open an location here at uh, the initial time. I present a valid POI sometime after and I get like rewards for this entire period. Um, then I like, I don't know, my server goes down or whatever. And I like miss, uh, like I I go over the, the threshold where like I should have presented a POI. So my allocation is now stale. Um, so the next POI I present here, uh, I won't get any rewards for all of these like period of time. Uh, but the next one after that one, uh, then I'm back, back on track, right? I presented this one and then 28 days later, I presented this one. So for this period, I, I do get rewards. Okay, that was a lot. Uh, we are on time. Uh, last slide, uh, as I mentioned, we are wrapping up a, a first audit with uh, Open Zeppelin uh, this week. Uh, we are open to feedback. Uh, if you wanna talk or discuss any of the details that I glossed over today, um, that's, that's gonna be great. Uh, we also have a, a second audit coming in and uh, we are soon like, putting together like a, a list or, or a document of all the changes that will be required on the off-chain components. Um, because that's, that's also gonna be like a substantial amount of work. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, sorry if this was a lot of information in a short amount of time, but yeah, as I mentioned, like the GAPs are quite lengthy. The original post is also uh, lengthy and very interesting. So I recommend that like, you go through all of those. I uh, just a lot of good information. Thank you, Tomas. Yeah. Just to be clear, you can go to the forum, you'll see them right away. There's a link to the full GIP, which is hosted on GitHub in our GIP's repo. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of... I see, yeah, I see a lot of activity yeah, in the chat, but Pablo... I, I... To be on top of everything. Pablo took care. Yeah. Thank you, Pablo. There's one. There's one question from Derek. And I know we're over time, so maybe let's try to answer Derek's last question. What will be the indicators for indexers to know that a service should have more stake? Uh, I think yeah. Thinking, I mean, in general, like for data services, what like the stake requirements? Um, I think that's going to be highly dependent on the data services. Uh, for instance, like a data service might require a minimum amount of stake in order for you to participate. Um, and the other big thing to consider is uh, like, if there are any incentives. Uh, I didn't mention anything about like issuance and what we are gonna be doing with the issuance. Uh, I know Rem could talk about that for hours, uh, but like governance might decide to assign a portion of issuance to like specific data services for them to distribute in a way that they see fit or not. I mean, there are several options for us there. Um, and yeah, in, the, in a sense, like indexing rewards is what drives today the need for for stake in a way. So um, they, they play a huge role in that. I don't know if that answers um, your question, Derek. I, I think for, for Derek's question in particular, there's also the, the, what, what Rem said where like, each data service would likely define a stake to fees ratio or something like that. So if you want to collect more fees, you need to add more stake to right. that data service. Um, and, and that's going to be kind of the, the, the indicator is, oh, I have, I don't know, 100,000 GRT <clears throat> to collect, but then I need right. to have a million GRT stake to be able to collect the right. Yeah, uh, that's, well, a, that's a great example. So in essence, the, the work you provide as a, as a service provider is tied to the payment you want to get. And that payment uh, is related to the stake uh, somehow or should be related to the stake, backed by that stake. And it's up to each individual data service to make that uh, like mapping, uh, probably using a follow mentioned like a, a stake to fees ratio, which means if I'm collecting one GRT in, in payments and like we have a ratio of 10, then I need to have 10 GRT as a stake uh, in order to collect that. And one more notice, we will likely 
propose some standards for how much data require because yeah. there's also like the security of one data service in a way could affect the security of the whole network. So having some standards on that will be important, I think, over time. So th those would be the guidelines of the frame framework, right, Pablo? Is that what you're talking about? Some sort of guidelines? Yeah, uh, that I mean, we're not we're not setting specific values at this point, but but at some point we should kind of have some guidelines for what is a good data service design. And I think when we plug in issuance incentives and things like that, for instance, meeting those standards will be important for a data service to be eligible for that. Yeah. All right. Let's wrap awesome. it up here. Thanks all. Again, this hey. update's always uh, uploaded to YouTube and we'll also have a tweet thread on all of these updates so the community can easily digest all of this info. And I appreciate you all for joining and okay. asking questions and participating. We'll be here in another month with more updates. Thank you, so, Pedro. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tomas. Thanks, Alex. Take care. See y'all.